This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum, bringing you Episode 4 of Season 2 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, January 23, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago as we read. The first section uh, on January 23, 1909 was the About Town section. Leonard W. Wheeler, tax collector, recently sold at public auction for non-payment of taxes a lot of land fronting on Cold Spring Road belonging to Hiram Leland. The purchaser purchaser was Emery J. Whitney, who has thoughts of watermelon raising on this land. He has been advised that the soil is excellent for this branch of farming, and the market still more excellent, especially moonlight nights. I think this is a reference to thieves visiting the watermelon patch uh, under the light of the moon to steal watermelons. J. Frank Chandler, a member of Westford Grange, was severely but not seriously kicked by one of his horses, the kick landing between the elbow and the shoulder. Dr. Sherman of Graniteville was summoned and found the flesh severely lacerated, but no bones broken. John H. Keefe on Francis Hill has sold very nearly all the standing wood on his farm to John J. Dunn of Chelmsford, who is busy making the wood take on a horizontal attitude. Wallace Johnson is busy hauling and sawing lumber for his new ice houses on Burgess Pond. It is rumored by authority that has figured some that the house will cost some $1,400. The state inspector of Barnes, who lives in Concord, has been doing home missionary work in town quite recently. A local paper reports that there is a bogus inspector of Barnes who is a sleek article along the line of talk and hypnotic on money matters. He certainly is no relation to the Concord variety, who recently called at the corner of Lowell and Stony Brook Roads, that's the home of Samuel L. Taylor, the author, who came close to to the borderline of the deaf and dumb, but was intensely all eyesight and saw everything and much he didn't see. In the account of the Unitarian Supper and Social given last week, some charming parts of the entertainment of the evening were unintentionally omitted, or rather through incomplete knowledge of the program. The numbers unreported were a song by Lillian Sutherland, violin and solo by Everett Miller, accompanied by Mabel Miller, duet Annie Drew and Mrs. Seavey, song Ruth Miller, accompanied by Mabel Miller. Among other features was the selling of jigsaw puzzles in charge of Mrs. Uh, by L. C. Abbott. The proceeds were $30, $33, which goes toward improvements and repairs on the interior of the church. The Honorable Herbert E. Fletcher started for Washington, D.C. in the early twilight of the week on business. He was the owner of the quarries on Oak Hill. The regular monthly sociable at the Congregational Church will be held in the vestry Tuesday evening, January 26th, and will be in charge of Mrs. Clara Grieg. This being so, no amount of evidence and rebuttal will be able to persuade the public, but that this entertainment will be brightly pivoted on the most entertaining keynote of life when the humorous play, How the Story Grew, is unraveled. In the cast are Mrs. Grieg, Mrs. Woods, Mrs. Woodward, Mrs. Knight, May Grant, Elizabeth Cushing, and Ruby Carter. In addition, there will be instrumental music and song music by those who have a song capacity and refreshments for the weak and weary. Uh, I might add that the play, How the Story Grew, was written by Mrs. O.W. Gleason and was described as, quote, an entertainment for women's clubs in one act. Eight female characters, Costumes, modern, scenery, unimportant, may be given on a platform without any scenery. Plays 45 minutes, a very easy and amusing little piece, full of human nature and hitting off a well-known peculiarity of almost any community. Written for middle-aged women and a sure hit with the audience. Uh, That came from the booklet, Humorous Monologues and Dramatic Scenes by Bill Marshall Locke, L-O-C-K-E, 
and others that was written in 1907 and is available at books.google.com. Isaac Whitney Hutchins, who died suddenly at Baldwinville last Saturday, was a native of Westford, the son of Eliakim Hutchins, the farm being located on the Concord Road near Parkerville. He is a brother of Mrs. E.J. Whitney of Westford. Daniel H. Sheehan, the cotton and cider manufacturer with mills on the Tadmuck Brook near the Lowell Road, has taken a large contract for sawing lumber for Warren H. Berry of South Chelmsford. The lot is in Carlisle. When this is finished, he has another contract for sawing in the town of Weston. Just who will superintend his cotton mills while he splits out sawdust and boards has not been named yet. A fire of large proportions broke out in the new brick mill of George C. Moore at North Chelmsford Tuesday evening about 5.30. Although several fire companies from Lowell responded to the call for assistance and the fire was gotten under control for some unknown under control, for some unknown cause it suddenly started anew and neither the Lowell department or the local fire department were able to cope with it and the mill was totally destroyed. The loss is reported at $700,000 with an insurance of $500,000. Mr. Moore will be remembered as the owner of a large mill in Brookside and other valuable property in town. Theodore H. Hamblett of Brookside had been seen has had seen the earth revolve on its axis and swing around the sun 90 years worth on Sunday, January 10th. He is still quick of speech and active of feet, and for rapid transit frequently easily beats the electric cars. Rising generations behold what temperance in all things will do to preserve health and faculties to a useful old age. Then go thou and do likewise. The H.E. Fletcher Granite Company have just completed a contract for stonework for the United States government on the new Treasury Building at Washington, D.C. Among other furnishings were 30 stone pillars, 32 feet long, 6 by 4 square. Transportation to Washington required a car, a car capacity of 100 tons to transport one pillar. The Boston and Maine Railroad have but three such cars, and they were pretty busy about that time. Uh, the, the, the most uh, architect- architecturally impressive feature of the Treasury Building is the east front colonnade running the length of the building. Uh, there, are, e- there are 30 columns, each of them 36 feet tall, and they were carved out of a single block of granite. The uh, material was of, the, of the original was acquired at Aquia Creek in Virginia, what they call freestone, which was largely replaced with granite in 1908, uh, apparently granite from the Westford Quarry. These were the pillars that were provided from our Westford Quarry. Check them out next time you're in Washington, D.C. So this, this really wasn't the new Treasury building. It was a repair of the old Treasury building. The next section is the Westford Center section. Mrs. John P. Wright and two daughters are visiting her parents at South Royalton, Vermont. Owing to the unwelcome interruptions interruptions of scarlet fever, this is the visit that was planned for Christmas. Mrs. Grace and Mary Burbeck have been guests for several days this week of their cousin, Mrs. Oscar R. Spaulding. Miss Mary is getting back to normal health from her 12-week siege of typhoid, as well as can be expected. The ladies' degree staff of the Grange held one of its well-attended degree rehearsals at the town hall Monday evening, working in some new features under the direction of Mrs. Fred L. Snow in place of some of the features formerly used. It was a small congregation that came out to the Congregational Church Sunday morning. Owing to the storm, Mr. Marshall's exchange with Mr. Bowden of Chelmsford was postponed, and Mr. Marshall conducted a good service in his own pulpit with the thought of attaining to our best possible selves for a subject. In the evening, a few came out in the storm, and the pastor gave a short talk on the first part of Pilgrim's Progress, and a good thing and a good sing was participated in. Mrs. Caroline Atwood quietly observed the 88th anniversary of her birth at home. She lived at Fort Graniteville 
road with her three uh, unmarried uh, daughters who lived with her. Charles L. Hildreth, in his 86th year, has so far recovered from his recent illness as to resume some of his former business activities in the care of his estate. Miss Mary Morin, our village nurse, returned to her home Tuesday from her- Herbert E. Fletcher's family, several of whose members have been visited by grip. The thermometer registered eight degrees below zero Tuesday morning, the coldest thus far of the season. The Spalding Light Cavalry Association held its regular monthly session at the association building Saturday afternoon and evening, January 16th. There was a good attendance of members from this and surrounding towns. At the business session, Captain S. H. Sherman H. Fletcher, president of the association, presided with Lieutenant Edward Fisher, secretary. At the close of the business meeting, a luncheon was provided by John Feeney, quartermaster, which was much enjoyed, along with the sociability and reminiscences of old Troop F and camping days at Framingham. Fully $25 were netted at the picture exhibit held at the new Center Schoolhouse, which will go toward the purchase of new pictures for the pleasant schoolrooms. This was the Turner Company exhibit that was mentioned last week. The next section is called Lectures. The fourth lecture in the Grange Entertainment course took place at the Town Hall last week, Thursday evening. It was thoroughly enjoyed by a good-sized audience, Rev. James D. Norcross of Jamaica Plain being the speaker of the evening with, quote, glass eggs under wooden hens, end quote, for a subject. He proved quite capable of keeping all of his audience interested from the time he began to speak until he finished, without one dull moment and with no adjuncts other than his own happy personality of bubbling good humor. It was a good place for the person who doesn't laugh very often, and for the person who does, for that matter, for he could tell more funny stories in an hour and weave in more wholesome truths at the same time than any speaker it has been our good fortune to hear for some time. His combination of a wooden hen and glass eggs stood for a simile of utter worthlessness. It was a combination of which nothing would come. You couldn't cook them into the delectable dishes that real articles would make, and just as little production of good in life were the idle hours on a human program, the unused dollar and the buried talent. It was a cheerful gospel of loving helpfulness that he preached. Preceding the lecture, the Grange Orchestra, which is improving all the time, gave some excellent selections. In line with the commendable enterprises in the March of Improvement, which dominate many of our village enterprises, is a new piano for the Academy. The one now in use, which has served for so many years, is quite impossible as a producer of harmony and should be put on the retired list with due appreciation of the good it has done in its more palmy days. At a recent meeting of the trustees held in Boston, $50 from the Academy Fund were voted toward the purchase of a new piano. The first effort of this kind will be a Valentine dance to be given in the room in in the town hall February 12th. It is sincerely hoped that all will cooperate to make this aim for a reasonably good piano possible for this present class and the classes that shall come after them. The next section is called Tadmuck. A good-sized audience of members and guests gathered at Library Hall Tuesday afternoon for the session of the Tadmuck Club and to hear Miss Elizabeth Richardson's address on Dr. Grenf- Grenfell's work in Labrador. Labrador. She gave an interesting account of personal experiences as a nurse in Dr. Grenfell's hospital at Battle Harbor and told many facts about these needy people on the bleak Labrador coast with their limited opportunities. She also enlivened her portrayal of the lives of these men, women, and children with some bright spots, and at the close, questions were asked and answered. The program was completed with a select reading by Mrs. Alice M. Lambert, after which a club tea was served and a social hour enjoyed. The next section is Graniteville. Fred R. Blodgett of the firm of Blodgett Brothers Milk Dealers has been confined to his home on Millstone Road for the past few days with an attack of the grip. 
Many people from this village attended the Cameron Circle, CF of A, dance in Forge Village last week, Friday evening, and had a very enjoyable time. The Westford Grange Orchestra furnished excellent music, and at intermission, refreshments were served. There has been an unusual amount of sickness in the village of late, due, no doubt, to the changeable condition of the weather. The local doctor has been kept on the jump during the past two weeks. William Marcione, a soldier in the Italian army who was stationed in the vicinity of Messina at the time of the earthquake, has sent word to his parents in this village that he is alive and well and considers himself lucky to be among those who escaped injury. The Turner Art Company held a public art ex- exhibition in the Sargent School here last Saturday afternoon, and the affair was an unqualified success. The pictures were very good and the variety excellent. The attendance was large, and the following teachers were very attentive to the wants of the visitors. Gerald Decatur, Miss Icy, or Izzy Parker, Miss Frances Bannister, and Miss Mary A. Dunn. A sale of homemade candies and popcorn was held, but the demand far exceeded the supply, and the entire lot was sold out in short order due in a great measure to the hustling qualities of the teachers and the bright, active children who attended strictly to business. The proceeds of the exhibit will go toward a fund to buy suitable pictures to be hung in the school building. This was the same uh, company, the Turner Art Company, that provided pictures for the a similar sale that was done at the Frost School the previous week and reported in the Westford Wardsman. The next section is the Forge Village section. The sixth social dance given by Cameron Circle in Abbott's Hall last week Friday evening proved a very enjoyable affair and was attended by many from out of town. The Grange Singing Orchestra of Westford furnished music for dancing. Refreshments were served during intermission. The following committee had charge of the affair. General Manager, Miss Dora LeDuc, Assistant Grace A. Ledwith, Floor Director, Mary J. Sullivan, Assistant Cora A. Shattuck, aides, members of the order. Mrs. Edwards is taking a large number of those working on the ice to board. Ice cutting is going on at North Littleton, and they will commence at Forge Pond in a few days. Uh, This was cutting ice uh, that would be sold uh, pretty much all over the world from Westford. The Mrs. Teresa Lowther and Rachel Cherry were invited guests at the performance of Cinderella, given by St. Andrew's Choir at the Vicarage in Ayer last week Thursday evening. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending January 23rd, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org, or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Alphen, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.